Good day, doctors. I am Dr. Joe Vicente Ponsaran, a fellow of the Philippine Society of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. Currently tasked here to talk about um, an overview of uh, bronchoscopy, uh, esophagoscopy, and tracheostopy. Uh, this lecture will not definitely replace the entire depth and length of the true course of the topic. Only until you reach Siguro uh, residency, I'll be more than happy to explain further through the stretches of my ability and my knowledge regarding this said topic. So this will be only an interview. I hope this will uh, uh, catch your interest, however, because this can be a little more, a little technical. I'll try to be make it to make it more simple for understanding. So let's start with bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy could either be done a flexible or a rigid. Flexibles are usually more uh, doable in the OPD setup, more uh, doable in, in a clinic setup than the rigid ones. Obviously, the rigid ones requires that the patient is uh, positioned in such a way that discomfort is really there when applied with the rigid bronchoscope. <clears throat> so, before we dive into bronchoscopy, let us talk about uh, pharyngoscopy because it is often, not actually often, it is always uh, being passed by the pharynx before we reach the bronchus. There are many things for us to pass by before reaching bronchus. So pharynx is one of them. So this is how it looks when we insert a flexible pharyngoscope or a flexible bronchoscope in our patient. It is usually from the pharynx or pharynx or nasopharynx then hypopharynx, so reaching to the bronchus. So, another um, area or cavity that we should also consider is the nasal cavity and also the nasopharynx being a part of the conduit when you're doing flexible uh, bronchoscopy. This could also both be done by rigid or flexible. Nakita nyo pa, nakatawa-tawa pa yung bata, for most likely, for sure, for sure lang si Tawa. So, uh, in nasal endoscopy, we, we shall see several structures. We have the turbinates, more often mistaken as uh, nasal masses by mothers, young mothers. Miatoses, of course, the gaps in between the nose and the floor of the nasal cavity. Yes, that's the most consistent landmark, even more consistent than the nasal septum because septums are sometimes deviated or perforated worse. Uh, nasal floor is made of the hard palate and the soft palate posteriorly and then uh, more posteriorly we can see the uh, eustachian tube opening so turbinates what are turbinates they are erectile soft tissues with a bony core ang lumalaki lang sa turbinate is the soft tissue component and uh, mucosa component but never the bony core this might need uh, the congestion for for easy application of the scopes for us to insert it atraumatically and non-bloody so that they shrink and it give us more room in the nasal cavity and it is uh, composed of three different turbinates we have the inferior middle and the superior turbinate <clears throat> so in these pictures we can see a middle turbinate there and the inferior turbinate below it so the space in between them is the middle meatus of course the picture there shows the septum the right side this another picture here shows that the inferior turbinate is already at the floor the space between the floor and the inferior turbinate there is called the inferior meatus that's how you usually that's where you usually pass the the scope the flexible scope when you're doing the flexible bronchoscopy nasal floor is made by the made of the, the palate the hard and the interior part and the soft and the posterior part this station tube os is found more posteriorly as I have mentioned. This is actually not the tube per se but rather the os or the opening. Nasopharyngeal wall at the back that is showing us the nasopharyngeal tonsils or the nasopharyngeal uh, lymphoid tissues at the back. And the uh, depression there is called the um, Rosenmuller fossa. But we will talk about it lang when we reach nasopharyngeal masses. I think may two more sa naman kayong lectures eh. Rosin molar fossa is an important structure to note uh, if there is there are doubtful masses or there are doubtful radiographic uh, 
uh, evidences for nasopharyngeal masses. It is found more posteriorly behind the nasopharyngeal area. Hypopharyngoscopy is uh, when we reach beyond the oropharynx. So we have the, the nasopharynx up above, oropharynx, and then the hypopharynx. The word hypo means below, so below the pharynx. But this time, it's the lowest portion or the lowest level of the pharynx. So what do you see in, the, in hypopharyngoscopy? You can see several structures. You have the epiglottis, the retinoids, this part, these are already part of the laryngeal structures. We also find the piriform sinus and the esophageal inlet. So laryngoscopy, of course, we take a look at the laryngeal structures, the laryngeal skeleton, which I mentioned already above and beforehand. Those are the retinoids, vocal cords, aripiglottis, aripiglottic folds, epiglottis, and uh, uh, the true and false vocal folds. Tracheostopy, tracheoscopy, the after reaching the larynx is already the trachea, correct? <clears throat> so tracheoscopy could be done uh, via two ways or two routes. It could be done via the pharyngolaryngoscopy or direct tracheoscopy through a tracheostomy tube inside to the dwelling tracheostomy tube. There is an example of a patient and a figure showing a tracheostomy uh, <clears throat> placed in the anterior neck of the patient. Tracheostomy is often, not actually often, is almost always placed for upper airway obstruction purposes. But of course, there are other indications to perform tracheostomy. A tracheostomy, rather. So tracheostomy through uh, the tracheostomy in situ is done directly to the hole of the tube to inspect the trachea below the insertion of the tracheostomy tube. Of course, this will not see the upper portions of the trachea. We should review that the, remember that the trachea is made of um, hyaline, hyaline cartilage, C ring shape, there are actually 18 to 22 of them, and the tracheal muscle completes the tubular structure of the trachea at the posterior part. So that we are reminded that the trachea's um, cartilaginous skeleton is only anterior and lateral parts. They are the, it is a vo, it is void of uh, of a cartilage posteriorly, and uh, it is approximately eight uh, approximately eleven cm in length, and two to two point five cm in diameter in an adult. Of course, younger patients have smaller and narrower and uh, shorter trachea. So why do we perform uh, tracheoscopy? We can perform a rigid tracheostomy for several purposes. It can be a diagnostic for tumors, diagnostic for foreign body, uh, diagnostic for evaluation of trauma, be it uh, penetrating or a blunt abdominal, uh, blunt uh, uh, cervical and, and um, thoracic trauma. It could be also therapeutic when we do excision biopsy, we can, we can do excision of the mass, removal of the foreign body. Those are for the rigid ones. Flexible tracheoscopies, uh, although they could be done in the OPD and uh, may not need admission, its practical use is can be limited only to a certain extent, especially if we do reformed body extraction that is just uh, done in a rigid way. And uh, excision, of course, excision is best done in a, in a rigid way. But all of that flexible uh, uh, tracheoscopy is Moreover, helpful in diagnosing neonatal or congestion, con congenital conditions that may need uh, that may need um, a flexible apparatus for us to observe. So, one of the uh, congenital or neonatal conditions that we find in the trachea is tracheomalacia. Tracheomalacia is the flaccidity of the supporting tracheal cartilages. <clears throat> so that is the trachealis muscle and then the intertracheal muscle, of course, also. Laxity or weakness in the intertracheal soft tissues and collapse in the wind pipe as the patient breathes. Pwede siya, nga in, pwede siya inspiration or expiration. Pro commonly during expiration na sila. Tracheoesophageal fistula could also be diagnosed through esophagoscopy, uh, through, through tracheoscopy flexible more than uh, in the, the rigid one 
uh, this is uh, a condition where na better connection between the esophagus and the trachea exists. It has several patterns. So, these are the patterns. Type C, type A, type H, type D, and type B. Some books will label this as 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Whichever book are you following or journals are you following. Also remember that the most common connection is, most common form is a blunt uh, sock pocket in the esophagus, uh, proximally, and then uh, distal, esophageal, tracheal, fistula, and the least most common is the other way around. Proximal connection of the esophagus to the trachea and the distal blunt pocket. Bronchoscopy. Now we have reached the bronchus from the trachea already. Bronchoscopy could be done rigid, which is done by the ENT, and these are the parts of the uh, regular bronchoscope. We have, uh, it is a little tricky because when you do bronchoscopy, you are performing this usually in general anesthesia. And we know that most of the safest way of doing a general anesthesia is through inhalational gas form rather than in the IV. So uh, we are actually performing an inhalational general anesthesia and then we are passing the rigid bronchoscope through the same route. So we have to have a connector between the the anesthesia machine and the bronchoscope itself so that we will be able to ventilate the patient while we are trying to perform our bronchoscopy at the same time. That occlusive eyepiece there in the rightmost part of the picture prevents the, the gas from going into our eye and or of course that prevents uh, us from inhaling the gas and, pre and prevents fogging the area for us to see clearly when we're doing the bronchoscopy. So there is another way to do it that we insert a flexible a rigid scope together with the bronchoscope and the flexible uh, the rigid scope is being attached to a, a monitor piece para makikita natin sa camera or sa monitor ang atong gina perform and then there are also ports for manipulation for the instruments how we usually do bronchoscopy is patient being supine <clears throat> uh, and of course patient should be some patients some books will say it is uh, normal normal neck flexion but uh, it is often it is often being practiced also that the patient's neck should be uh, hyperextended so it's, so it's to straighten the airway the right main stem bronchus is the first thing that we should look for when we're doing the bronchoscopy past the trachea already of course so the right stem main stem bronchus is more parallel to the trachea bigger bore or bigger in diameter and a little shorter thus more of the foreign bodies are lodged there in the right than in the left so as i mentioned it is the practical one of the practical applications of bronchoscopy is foreign body removal another one is tumor extirpation and of course, uh, evaluation and diagnostic purposes also. Let's go to esophagoscopy. Esophagoscopy is like bronchoscopy in uh, applying, because we, we insert the esophagoscope in the oral cavity, through the oral pharynx, hypopharynx, then eventually only reaching the esophagus instead of reaching the larynx. So esophagoscopy is also being done in such a in such the same manner. In the same manner, GA siya, and a patient is also supine. In this case, as the picture also shows, we also need to have the patient in the hyperextended position. But other books will say, okay lang siya kahit supine, better daw, ah, kahit neutral position ng patient. Here are the, the instruments used being used in esophagoscopy. It's less complicated to bronchoscopy because then we don't need to ventilate the patient through our instrument per se. Uh, the patient will be intubated with a endotracheal tube instead of the ventilator passing through the instrument itself. And so we only have uh, either a, a hole to peep into or we can also insert a rigid scope through the hole. We should always remember that the esophagus is a collapsed conduit because there is a redundant mucosa as so the patient is lying down supine. We should have our scopes positioned they say bevel up daw ba or bevel down. So this figure shows uh, 
the bevel there the bevel is actually pointing down the bevel part there is the is the oblique part so the so that the longer part of the tube is positioned above the bevel is the oblique part ha not the extended portion of the tube so that when we in example ma uh, segue lang kita when we do uh, uh, venipuncture, we always say bevel up, then okay, gatanga, gatanga siya, we don't insert the needle this way, diba? Patanga on mo siya in such a manner there you are we should always remember uh, that there are four normal anatomical constrictions of the esophagus, so that when we're doing esophagus there are sometimes parts that are, it may be hard, or you may feel resistance, that is normally found in this in these areas. So, plecophryngeus, that's the muscle hugging the esophagus from the trachea around uh, one side of the trachea, uh, one side of the cricoid to the other. So, since it forms a sling, sometimes that muscle contract, uh, contracts, thus you will feel some constrictions in that area when you insert the scope. Care should be taken, reason later lang natin ihambal, to somehow forcefully insert the scope in the plecophryngeus. But of course, as a rule, pag medyo, ano siya, medyo hard, you do not just uh, push the scope forcefully. No? You try to manipulate. If not, uh, call it as uh, constriction already. You might not be able to pass it through or pass it to a different resident, different doctor to perform it. Another one is an arc of the aorta. Uh, because as the arc of the aorta is slinging over, going down to the... To the, to the thoracic and abdominal aorta it somehow somehow impinges on certain area of the esophagus thus causing constriction also external external constriction the left main stem bronchus is another one and uh, compressing also and then the left and the GE junction or gastrointestinal junction gastroesophageal junction rather is another constriction some books will say the diaphragmatic urn uh, diaphragmatic Hiatus is the one that causes some books will say uh, G junction, but for for me, I believe in the school of thought that uh, it is the G junction being the fourth for constriction of the esophagus when we do our uh, esophagoscopy. Here is uh, the reason why we do not uh, forcefully insert the esophagoscope when we're performing the esophagoscopy as we pass by the cricophrenous area because of this structure, the Killian's triangle is actually a weakness or a weakening, a weakened part of the of the posterior esophageal area so that when we are inserting the scope and we forcefully insert it through, this, through the cricopharyngeus, we might perforate that part there, Killian's triangle and there, it's the most uh, posterior part of the area. There are two other structures on the side but it's less important for our case. So this is one, one point to remember. Practical applications of the esophagoscopy are removal of the foreign body, of course. Uh, one of which that we should remember that before we extract the foreign body, we should somehow uh, try to make the position of the foreign body at least parallel to the, to the esophagus. If the foreign body is lodged perpendicularly, we just don't pull the the foreign body as it is, we will always try to reposition it as parallel as possible so that the extraction of the foreign body will be less traumatic and uh, we will not be adding injury to an already probably injured esophagus. Say for example, there is an impaled section of the foreign of the esophagus due to the sharpness of the edge of the foreign body. Then we just pull it out with the impaled part there. So pwede natin siyang ma-tear up and it's a further, further. So that's, you're actually doing more injury than good. And we should always remember as much as possible to clasp that sharp part first and to keep it inside the esophagoscope as we pull it out. If we cannot make sure it's pointing downward rather than it's pointing upward. Or pointing, uh, yeah, distal rather than it's pointing proximal or pointing to us. And then eventually, last thing to remember is to... Uh, as much as possible, we should remove the foreign body, the grasper, and the scope as a single unit. And yes, of course, if the foreign body cannot be 
cannot be removed in a single uh, uh, insertion in cases of meat, foreign body, in cases of balot, foreign body, and other foreign bodies in the esophagus that may need piecemeal removal. In that case, you don't need to remove the scope. You just need to maintain the scope there and then you do piecemeal removal of the foreign body. But saying, for example, if the foreign body is as solid as a coin, you can grasp the coin and then pull the coin a little bit inside the foreign inside the esophagus scope and then you remove the three as a single unit. Here is an example of a bone in the esophagus. There you see that the sharp edge is uh, slightly impaled in the lateral of the esophagus and then the operator there tries to manipulate its position and since uh, the sharp edge is impaled you position it more parallel, more parallel to the esophagus, or the esophagus, then eventually pull the esophagus and the esophagus scope and the grasper as a single unit with the sharp point facing downwards or facing distally. So uh, here's an example, medyo malas malas lang. If this is the situation in the left picture, you see an open, open safety pin with of course the, with the, the the pin being facing uh, facing towards you or facing towards the the pharynx facing upward you just don't pull the head of the safety pin and let the sharp edge of the open safety pin tear up the esophagus you'd rather you'd rather hold that sharp edge as you pull on the contrary if the position of the safety pin which is in the right picture showing that the point ed pointy edge is pointing downward if you don't have a chance of pull holding the sharp edge uh, you can pull the safety pin safely out upward anyway to that position as yes, generally speaking uh, it will not be causing as much injury as you pull it in the position of the other picture in the left side however that also shows practically speaking that the in the left picture the foreign body is lodged more inferiorly because there is a capacity for it to go down farther because of its position. The one in the picture on the right side did not dis did lodged rather more severely because syempre, na sangit na ang iyang sharp edge so why hindi na siya move farther. So pulling it in that direction could already be safe. So swallowing as part of uh, uh, esophagus is, can be touched lang. So there are three phases of swallowing, oral, preparatory phase, pharyngeal, and esophageal. Eventually, the last two stages are involuntary. Wala na magagawa dyan. Once swallowed, wala na. Oral phase lang atong ang swallowing. Once it, we start pushing the bolus backwards to the pharynx, wala na. Swallowing is, we should remember, is time shared. We cannot swallow uh, at the same time breathe. Because uh, when we swallow, we are only using one pharynx. Ba? We have two tubes uh, down below the pharynx. We have the trachea, we have the esophagus. But above, we have only one pharynx. So preparatory phase, you cannot chew at the same time, breathe. That's why transient cessation of breathing and then swallowing of saliva and bolus could only happen uh, one at a time because they're sharing one time they're only sharing the time so that we know that patient patients cannot swallow and breathe at the same time otherwise masalamukan ni kao that's aspiration so or digital regurgitation this commonly happens in neonates because their pharynx and the laryngeal structures are not yet well developed so how is aspiration prevented as we swallow we were designed or programmed or made with many more than just one properties or mechanisms for swallowing to be safer and we are prevented from aspirating as we swallow the laryngeal inlet goes up pushing the peglutis mechanism down thus covering the larynx and that is also uh, coupled with the closure of the glottis the glottis is being closed because hindi naman tayo we breathe in as we swallow so close glottis covered with the the peglutis, that's two already in the laryngeal side. We should have, we were <coughs> designed to have a piriform sinus to guide, to guide our bolus from the tongue 
then to the pharynx as it goes down behind it the bolus splits or either what goes one way to go through the side of the larynx here in, in the middle to go to the side to the piriform sinus eventually to the esophagus and of course not but the, uh, last but not the least all of those three mentioned above is not gonna perform well with an unpatent esophagus pag covered esophagus there is so much time lang and eventually those three mechanisms will eventually give in with an unpatent esophagus hindi makapasok yung from bolus inside the the, uh, the esophagus then eventually ma-aspirate kagid okay, there's only so much seconds that you can hold your breath so kung hindi siya patent mabalik na siya to somewhere in the pharynx or eventually shoot fall into the pharynx or larynx rather we should also remember that uh, the esophageal contraction is weakest at the right at the right at the segment after the cricopharyngeus. Esophageal contractions are mixing and propulsive or peristaltic duana sila. And esophageal swelling by gravity is less affected and not affected even in the best days. So that you can swallow actually kahit you're upside down you can swallow it. You can swallow saliva. That's because gravity is uh, less of a concern there. It's more of the esophageal muscle contractions that helps us deliver or swallow. So if you have questions, I am uh, apologizing ahead of time because this is a pre-recorded lecture. The, uh, our facilitators and other moderators will be able to answer your questions. I hope you learned something from uh, today's lecture and I'm more than happy to answer your questions personally. Feel free to message me. Apayo ala sa ila ako number pwede kit. Anytime. I hope you will do well in your school and eventually find more interest and drive to pursue medical career. Thank you.